this evening city council is meeting in a planning and development committee and then at 7 30 we will go into a regular session of council planning and development committee is chaired by jim sands mr president tonight we have one item on our agenda um, and that's this discussion of a resolution supporting the recommendation of the Stroud Run Task Force and requesting the mayor to investigate funding sources. And actually this uh, resolution is at the request of the mayor. Um, the task force spent quite a bit of time investigating the possibilities, potentials involved in the possibility of us taking over Stroud Joint Park made a presentation several weeks ago um, and the mayor has requested this resolution from council um, encouraging giving him the authority and encouraging him to proceed with further investigations regarding funding and answering some questions regarding transfer of ownership versus just um, management of the park from, from the state. So there are several whereases in this resolution. It begins with whereas the state of Ohio has expressed an interest in transferring the ownership and operation of Stroud Run State Park to the city of Athens. And it goes on for several more, but then it ends up with be it resolved by the council of the city of Athens that we do hereby support the recommendation of the Stroud Run Task Force and we just further desire we desire further information regarding financing such a venture and request that the mayor investigate the terms and conditions of the land transfer and funding sources in order to provide final contractual details um, this would be a one reading resolution um, that again authorizes the mayor to investigate this question further it's no there's no commitment involved here. Uh, there were several questions from council earlier in discussion about this. Any comments or questions now, Paul? Um, essentially, uh, in section two there, looking at the financial part, that's the important part to me. Um, see, I've been basically getting feedback from various people on the phone that they don't like the idea of us spending money on something like this when we need police and fire. Um, I took a walk around Strouds Run um, the weekend before Thanksgiving, and I think I ran into uh, half a dozen people, and um, six out of six were basically, I, you know, I was basically saying, should we take it over? Because they're there, and most of them said no, uh, for various reasons. Some of them like the primitive nature of it, the fact there isn't a ranger there, so they can walk their dog without being yelled at. Some thought that it was great that they could just run around and have nobody watching them, I guess. I don't know. But the other thing, the, what? Nothing. No. <laughs> oh yeah, I know. Um, but the same. The, the bottom line is that most of the feedback I've been getting is that uh, we have other financial uh, priorities. So just so you know, uh, I mean, I'll probably move. I think this should be moved ahead to investigate more. But the emphasis will be on the financial side. Carol. Well, I, I do think it's important to uh, remind folks that the proposal is not to uh, increase the management of uh, Stroud's run, it's to uh, keep it uh, on a fairly low key basis and um, to provide opportunities for programs that are well suited to the area. Uh, so I think the concern that it's going to be someone from the city looking over folks' uh, shoulders out there is uh, not very accurate. I do think there are a lot of financial questions that need to be addressed, and, and the recommendations from the uh, task force said that, that there are a lot of things that have to be in place to make it work, and certainly the management plan is a major one. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, this particular resolution is just supportive of continuing the investigation. Um, the wording in the first whereas um, refers to interest in transferring the ownership and operation, and that's been one of the questions that's come up. Are we talking about ownership or are we talking about management? And we believe that we're talking about ownership. 
and even though this area m may appear primitive and, and remote, it does require some kind of management um, for safety issues, for access, for, for all kinds of things. So, um, and that, that would be where the city would come in. Any other council members? Nancy? Um, I don't support this. I um, basically, I've told you already, I've heard from people that there's no way in the world we're ever going to have ownership of it. And I think those people were talking from a higher level of authority than, and I just don't think I'm for it. I would rather see our police restored to the pre, um, to the Clinton era level. And if it costs $50,000 to come up with a management plan, that's one policeman one year. So I'm not in favor of it. I don't want to co-sponsor it. I mean, all we, we've had two meetings, and all people have talked about is this machinery question. And you know, it seemed like I think the Strauss Run Task Force did a good job, except for the financial part. And I think it was pathetic what we got from them, which was nothing. Mm -hmm. I, maybe pathetic is too strong a word. Let me reel it back. My head is pounding. Um, let me say instead that it was very inadequate because they don't know. And when they don't know, I guess I'm concerned. Debbie. Um, I would just say, as I've said since I first heard about the recommendations, that I think there does need to be a lot more information about the plan for financing it. Um, I can't say one way or the other whether I would support the, the final thing that comes to us because we don't know yet how this will be paid for. So I, I wonder if there's something we can do with language um, in section one at the bottom, you know, talking about supporting the general idea, but I, you know, the, the recommendations are really not um, finalized enough to be able to say clearly one way or the other whether we support it, I, I feel. Okay. Um. Section one, the Athens City Council does hereby support the recommendation of the Strouds Run Task Force, the recommendation which was to take over ownership and, and management. So, and your suggestion for wording there is supports or is, is interested in, Paul? Conditional on finances, I guess, something of that nature. I mean. to say I, I agree. Um, I fully support Section 2, and I think it's a very unique opportunity that the city has to take over the park, but um, I'm very concerned if we just say we fully support all the recommendations, especially hinging on number two. It seems contradictory <coughs> right now, as it's stated. The Athens City Council has received the recommendation of the Stroud Run Task Force and thanks them for their I work. Thanks them for their work and has thanks them further for their questions. Work, okay, okay. <clears throat> Any other Jim. questions? Oh, Paul, I'm sorry. Um, another question. Um, does this commit us to money for a management plan? Spending money? I mean, that's the implication I was hearing from Nancy just now, and this is not really a... As I understand this resolution, no, it does not commit us to any money spent. Okay. So it won't Except be 50000 and 50000 which we this, have The recommendation yeah. said that, but we're not voting on, on accepting the recommendation. We're asking the mayor to investigate further the possibilities for or financing this and then come back to us and at that time we would vote on whether we were going to authorize any spending or financial commitments this is just authorizing the mayor to have further discussions we still have to clear up the ownership issue and all everybody has suggested that we still have questions about the possibility of the financing so this is just the same you, you formed a task force. The task force has, has re reported to us. Now, Mr. Mayor, please go ahead and, and look at these other questions. So we will not spend a single cent of 50000 even if it's even if it's um, 
I mean, except for travel, which would come normally, or was something on that order. With, with this resolution, no. Okay. Could we write that in? That we're not committing any funds till we get <clears throat> until we get um, a full report. First of all, whether ownership is accept is even an option. Okay. Jim. Carol. I just borrowed Debbie's copy of the the task force. I didn't have mine, but I I thought think it's important to kind of take a look at what the recommendations to the mayor were that we're saying that we're supportive of. And first, it's we recommend that the city enter into an agreement with ODNR to assume title, maintenance, and operation of Stroud's Run. So it's very clear in that recommendation that it includes ownership. Then we recommend that the mayor seek approval of the following ordinances from city council to facilitate the operation. And without all it's asking is that he you know, continue the process, it does not really imply that um, council would, would vote on every ordinance favorably or anything like that. It, it basically says that uh, the mayor has to be the um, driving force here in terms of um, putting together legislation that could potentially make it work. But it also very clearly implies title, not just management. Yeah. So then, um, with that in mind, the mayor is allowed to spend twenty thousand out of rec line for personal services, or, or no, for services, and professional services, I should say. I think it's twenty thousand. It's a lot of money, and so you know, a lot of the money that's appropriated could be used. And so I guess I would ask for a gentleman's agreement that we wouldn't proceed until we know, until council approves it. The mayor will speak in a minute here. Paul, did you have one more thing to say? Um, no, I, 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 well, yes, I think um, I, I'd like to see this move forward to investigate it, but that's really where I'd like to, you know, I, I think it would be foolish not to investigate and, and look at it. But again, I, I am hesitant oh. about, you know, as I say, I, I have lots of people come back at me saying police and fire, police and fire, you know. And I've heard the same comments and I have the same concerns. As I understood this, as I understand this resolution, all we're asked, all it authorizes is the mayor to investigate further. Okay. <laughs> mayor Abel, would you like to speak to your understanding of what we're doing here, please? Well, I have taken this as being <clears throat> one where. We need to finalize things with the state of Ohio as to exactly what they're willing to enter into as an agreement. But in addition to that, we have to see what other partners there are and what commitments they would make. And even though, you know, in, in talking to some of the, those constituent groups, the feedback I get is, well, is council going to do this? And I say, well, they've made no indication of whether or not they would or they would not, but I think they're concerned about the finances of it. Therefore, more partnerships that help lessen the financial burden of, to the city would be beneficial. So I felt that with some type of a resolution uh, that council is comfortable with, and that's why I really haven't entered the discussion, because it can't be my resolution. It has to be yours. But authorizing me to go forward to try to seek other partners that would help us in the financial burdens with uh, Stroud's run, um, and also to find out what exactly, if it is the title, uh, what c conditions the state might put upon that. Because obviously, uh, I don't think they want to give it to us and give us total authority to sell it off or, or anything else. I mean, there's going to be some conditions and strings that the state of Ohio will want to put on it. We don't know what all those are, but we need to have that. And that's what I don't want to have to spend the staff time and effort to go out and do all of that if the majority of council says that you know, they, they don't wish to support it. Uh, and to the issue of the finances, sure, everything the city does costs money. You see things in the budget that's being presented tonight that we've gone through 
numerous committee meetings on, uh, and council members have made choices in, in that respect as to what they want to fund and what they don't want to fund. Uh, it's something that's what we're elected to do. We make those choices. I only recommend you, you have the final say on those. And, but this would give me, a, you know, I think what I'm hearing from some members of council is they want to further qualify it. But unless you're serious about really looking at it, vote no against it. You know, don't put everybody in the public that supports you through it. If you're going to say the only extra dime I'm going to do is for a policeman or a fireman, then just vote against it. Because you've already done different than that in the budget you're going to, you know, hear, you know, later tonight. Because you've made choices and decided you want a city planner. And you up the fees uh, in the code enforcement office to pay for it. <clears throat> Didn't go to police or fire. You had your own choices. Further comments from council? <clears throat> Anyone from the audience? Yeah, money, money's tight, but opportunities Introduce, are... I'm sorry. Oh, I'm Greg Broadhurst. Uh, I live at 14 Granville Avenue in Athens. Um, I worked in the National Park System, the U.S. Forest System, and for the U.S. Department of Agriculture for a total of about 10 seasons. So I'm um, closely... Uh, knowledge, I'm very knowledgeable of what it takes to run a park and what programs are needed, and I've had opportunities to be in on some budgetary decision making in regards to some small park operations. Um, this opportunity, <coughs> along with the fact that we've already acquired these other adjacent lands, uh, one of them which is actually a, a study area, as you probably well know, <coughs> in Hawk Woods, uh, forms a complete uh, a contiguous uh, greenway that we have been committed to in the past and are committed to. and. I just want to say we haven't had enough time to really look at it in terms of funding sources, in, in terms of cooperators, in terms of uh, uh, management uh, op uh, management opportunities, in, which are which are which would include funding from other sources. I don't need to go into it right now, but there needs to be an opportunity, and I ask you to support the uh, the uh, mayor in the in the, in the sense of you know, giving your support to him to be able to go forward to find out what those uh, resources are. So even though money's tight, we don't give up an opportunity that we may not be able to get again. And we'll be able to bring into some, some more partners on board. We'll be able to find some other funding sources. Um, if anybody's interested, one might look at the city of Aurora, Ohio. It's uh, up near the Great Lakes. And... Uh, some of the uh, management uh, scenarios that, that are involved with uh, cooperating with Metro Park Districts. So uh, maybe you haven't, haven't had the opportunity to look at these things yourself, but I encourage you to go forward with the resolution of support to allow the mayor to be able to find other sources and cooperators so that this can be successful. Thank you. Thank you. Robert? <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Robert Sumney. I live at uh, 20 Briarwood in Athens. And uh, I would like to uh, ask the uh, City Council tonight to go ahead and exercise uh, fiscal restraint by rejecting further exploration or negotiation regarding the transfer of ownership of Stroud's Run. Uh, some of the very things that uh, the mayor and some other people have already brought up should really be uh, indicative of why we need to, to accept this idea. Um, it, no, it wouldn't be foolish just to go ahead and reject tonight um, as far as any further exploration uh, for the very reasons that uh, last week uh, in talking about uh, the upcoming budget, we were talking about moving the uh, either uh, uh, eliminating some current recreation projects or moving uh, road maintenance money into recreation. So we're already uh, jockeying money uh, to to uh, take care of the city recreation department, which is not making money. Um, 
the idea that uh, Councilman Tamke brought up that they would like to um, improve stagnant uh, uh, city salaries, uh, and yet we would add a $48,000 administrative position uh, for this effort. Uh, the city has made no compelling case why the city of Athens should financially go it alone, and I don't see partnership, permanent partnership, uh, on the horizon in talking with uh, a commissioner from the Athens County Commission. They did not see, uh, or he did not see any foreseeable future uh, in the Athens County Commission coming on board as a partner. Um, the $50,000 that Ohio University was supposed to kick in for a three or five year <coughs> period, um, I understand that that may not be the case, um, and maybe the mayor could clarify that, that in fact, uh, uh, President McDavis had said that uh, there was the possibility that, that department heads could donate money or contribute money from their budgets, but, you know, and if that happened to total $50,000, great. But again, to uh, uh, an OU administrator who told me that so far there had only been two or three departments who had taken them up on that offer, and it fell far short of $50,000. So there, you know, there's a question that I have as to whether there's a firm $50,000 uh, proposal out there, donation from the university itself, who, according to the task force, would be the primary uh, or one of the primary beneficiaries of this uh, program. Um, allowing that the city can generate revenues from $18,000 to $30,000, which, again, according to the, uh, the task force plan, is, is rather vague how they would do that. But, you know, saying that they did, you know, that would still leave $100,000 that the city of Athens would be responsible for if it did not find partners. Again, when we are short on, on police and we are in need of other things that are, are more vital and more central to the needs of the community, then, you know, I think this is kind of a wish list kind of a thing. It's not something that is necessary. And when someone says that council makes choices all the time about what they're going to spend money on or not, you know, I, I agree with that. However, I think your job is also to further what do you really need to spend money on versus what you would like to spend money on. Um, the uh, city, as far as additional funds in, in talking with the city administrator, said that, well, one of the other things that we're kind of doing is, you know, accepting donations. Uh, you know, when someone dies and they happen to be a Stroud's Run enthusiast, you know, we're hoping they donate money uh, to Stroud's Run management. Um, these are things that, you know, if, if somebody such as myself came forward and said, hey, why don't we take ownership of Stroud's Run, um, you know, I don't think that you would take it terribly seriously because you would know that there are other important financial considerations necessary. Um, the uh, couple other points I would just like to make is that in 1998, the city spent about $19.5 million. Uh, in 2004, the city spent about $33 million, actually over $33 million. Um, and there yet, with the exception of East State Street, there hasn't been any significant new revenue streams to, to take care of added projects like Stroud's Run. Um, imagine that it took us nearly 200 years to get to $19 million and in eight, in eight years, we've come close to doubling that. So these are things that you do have decisions to make, and you do have important decisions to make as to what the city of Athens really needs. And while I agree with some of the people in the audience that it would be nice to have Stroud's run, um, still looking at other things the city is going to need in the near foreseeable future, then I think that is something that you need to reject and why waste any more t of the mayor's time on it? Why waste any more of your time on it? Um, the uh, last thing is that someone said, the city administrator, 
uh, had mentioned that, well, it would be nice to uh, have Stroud's run because it would be a nice legacy for future generations here. I think it would also be a good legacy for the city council to leave Athens for future generations to a town that was affordable to live in. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Muriel? Muriel Grimm, 24 Canterbury. Uh, I think I just sort of have a question as to what precisely your um, options are tonight. Um, I, I'm not clear, and I'm, I'm not sure whether you all are. I, uh, could you turn down this recommendation? It sounds as though there is a certain amount of support for having the mayor investigate further possible funding sources, but uh, it sounds also as though the way the um, resolution is written, that isn't, um, uh, the way it's written is not acceptable to doing that. So I'm just wondering if there could be some clarification as to um, what, what you what, can actually do. Actually what we're doing tonight is discussing that language. We would not introduce this until next Monday. So changes can be made, and some, some editorial changes have already been made. But I, I think that council members do understand that this is authorizing the mayor to look at more information regarding this. One piece of information is funding sources, um, investigating those more fully. Um, and I, I think council members understand that in, in general with the language that there is but again um, we've amended the the language about fully supporting we've received a report and and I think we might include something that this resolution does not commit us to to authorizing any expenditure of funds um, rather it's seeking funds for, for the future so this is just a discussion about a resolution that we would put up a week from tonight for reading. Okay, yeah, I'm and sorry. And further discussion. Yeah, I misunderstood that. Okay. I, thought, I thought that this was the final statement. Yeah. Yeah. Audience members, or council members, Paul? Uh, again, really to reiterate this, I think this is something, from my point of view, we should look at. Um, and again, I didn't think we'd be, the idea of spending money on it as a management plan is not what I'm for. Um, I want to see a, a harder deal struck with ODNR, just not 50000 for one year. <coughs> and this has nothing to do with the resolution in that sense. But I'm looking and saying, you know, if it's going to cost us, I think the recommendations from the task force are 130 to 150000 a year. That to me is not anywhere near acceptable. And I don't know what that number would be where I'd cross over and say, yes, I'd vote for the final uh, approval of this. But um, I'd want to make sure everything's intact. I think Dale brought up the fact what happens if, if, if there is a shortfall, where is the, who makes it up? I think that was a month ago he brought that up. And these are the considerations I have. I mean, I look and say we don't, we can't patrol it with police, and that's not the case in this case if we don't annex it in. Um, the other question I had at the time was, you know, what's the worst case scenario? And I think uh, Dr. Cantino would say, well, the Senate bill might pass and we might have oil wells there or gas wells or logging. Um, I don't know if that would happen. Um, that seemed to me to be very remote, but I don't know. And, and therefore, I don't, uh, again, the, you know, I've done my polling out at the place. I've walked around in the past couple weeks just to check it out. I look at the cost of what it would take to maintain it and keep it running. And um, uh, right now, I'd lean against it, but at the same time, I want to hear more because there, there's, you know, this is the whole point of, of investigation of it. Right. Paul, I think most of us on council are in similar position to you. Um, we think this sounds like a a good idea, but we have serious questions about how we can make it work. Um, I also have heard comments from citizens who are concerned and citizens who think it's a good idea, but have questions. And so um, I think it's I think it's uh, a reasonable thing to try to get some answers to those questions. Okay. And so I will um, bring this resolution up for a vote 
a week from tonight. And that ends planning and development. And it's time to start our regular session of Athens City Council on or about 7.30 p.m. December 5th, 2005. City Council is now in session of a regular meeting. We do have a quorum with six of seven members present. Communications, I am in receipt of probably about six different uh, items of communication that uh, has been spoken to in the um, newspaper regarding conflicts of interest. So I will just acknowledge to the people that have sent me the emails that they are in receipt that the uh, law director is addressing those issues. And I understand we may be discussing that somewhat later on tonight in executive session. Um, other communications anyone wishes to share? Reports and communications from other elected officials. Let's start with the law director. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I would report to council that uh, Gilberto Chavez, one of my, my part-time uh, prosecutor, has resigned to take another position. So we're currently down a half-time prosecutor. Oh, good. <laughs> okay. Oh, who first? How about City Auditor Kathy Hecht? Um, I don't have any report, but can someone move to accept our, we didn't ever accept our October minutes uh, for the auditor's office in November. Someone would move to accept The October those. report? Yes, our, our October, our monthly reports don't come out until about a month into the next month. Usually at the second meeting of the month, we accept them, and we didn't do that in November. I, I move that we accept the auditor's report for, for the month of October. Thank second. you. Motion and a second. Is there further discussion? All those in favor of accepting the reports of the auditor for the month of October 2005? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? The reports have been accepted. Thank you. November's about yeah. soon. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Abel. No report. No report. <clears throat> Ordinances for second reading. Ordinance 120.05. An ordinance approving a planned unit development proposed by National Church Residences on Stimson Avenue and granting a variance. Member Sant, well, I'm sorry. Second. second reading. Are there those that wish to speak to Mr. this President, tonight? Yes. I move to amend 120.05. Okay. Um, second. There, well, you don't know what it is yet. <laughs> <laughs> there are two. I think I need to do these one at a time, right? So um, the first one is <coughs> in section three to add another condition, which I believe would be come 17, um, which states prior to commencing site development work, NCR will post a performance bond in the amount of $200,000 according to the term set forth by Athens City Code 21.08.02, which spells out how performance bonds are handled. Um, so that's the motion. We have a motion and a second to amend mm -hmm. Ordinance 120.05. Is there further discussion on the amendment? Uh, Member Weil. So this is, when you say performance bond, this is for um, any type of impact um, on the surrounding areas or something? Or? The concern that's been expressed is that if there's any impact on the public infrastructure in the area, including water and sewer and storm sewer lines um, and the bike path that, that the city may end up having to repair, that there would be money in place to do that. There's just been a lot of concern that the construction so close to those sewer lines could have some potential impacts. Um, when, when developments involve infrastructure that we're going to take over, we've traditionally had a performance bond, and then after it's been accept, inspected and accepted, that's returned to the developer. This is something that was um, brought up by citizens as a, a possibility during the last discussion of this ordinance. Um, and I've just tried to figure out a way to put it into some kind of language to address citizen concerns. <coughs> Member Patterson. Did you say as a whereas, was that what? No, as a condition. And I look. Number 17. The whereas is already oh, include, okay. um, whereas it is in the public interest to protect existing public infrastructure, such as water, sewer, and storm sewer <coughs> lines, 
and uh, whereas it's sound planning practice to provide suitable access to existing public facilities such as the bike path. So I guess I felt that the whereas has already covered the, the expressed concern about protecting public infrastructure. This would just create a mechanism that if there were any damage, we'd have a way to um, go back and repair that. Further comments? So Member Sands. This bond, this performance bond, would not already be covered and already levied by the Planning Commission's work because we're not accepting any new infrastructure. Is that correct? <coughs> Is that, um, that why we're adding it? They did not require a performance bond. Um, I'm assuming that that's why. It's not something that's always done. It was done in um, the University Estates when that first came through that was in that development agreement so but I think that was related again to sewer and roads that we will ultimately be um, taking over and maintaining so this is a little bit different than that okay. is it, member Bain is it true that a performance bond is an insurance policy rather than an absolute investment of money right okay. and the existing policy um, spells out that it's the kinds of instruments that can be used, um, the kind of accounts that the money can be deposited in, and at the rate at which the developer gets that money back over a period of time. So the section that I referenced lays out the mechanisms. <clears throat> Further comments? Member Weil. So this is really to cover the, um, make sure the conditions, what, one and two and three and four are met. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Okay. Other comments? Five. We have a motion and a second to amend Ordinance 12005. All those in favor <laughs> of the amendment as read? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. The, yeah. Aye. Uh, the ordinance has been amended by one. Mr. President, I move to amend O12005 to um, add another condition, which would be number 18 in section 3, which states National Church Residences will form a Neighborhood Advisory Committee before the development of final plans to include residents of the Near East Side area who are not residents of the NCR planned unit development, this advisory committee will be in existence for as long as National Church Residences manages the proposed retirement center. Do I have a second? Second. Um, the reason for this amendment is that um, citizens have continued to approach me expressing concern that a lot of the issues which were discussed and the attempts at finding a kind of a compromise have maybe not been followed as strongly as they would like. They see some of the things in here, but there's just a concern that some of the things that citizens wanted the most um, require a supermajority to become a part of the ordinance. Um, so citizens expressed a desire to have some mechanism to you know, have a formal relationship with NCR and have some way to um, continue to be part of the discussion as plans are finalized. Sorry, uh, who, who would be on the committee and how would it run? The, is that going to be spelled out or is it? I didn't put that kind of detail in it. Um, I, I don't believe that there's been any objection to the idea and the developer all along has stated they're willing to continue working with the neighborhood. I see them nodding their heads, so I, I, I'm sure that we can work <coughs> something out. I don't know that we need that level of detail in here. The, um, okay, not right now. <laughs> Member Weil. Uh, so um, when you say neighborhood advisory, you, you are talking about some of NINA, I assume, Near East Neighborhood Association, or members of that, or? People who live in that neighborhood. I don't think they would have to be NINA members. Okay. People who live near to the proposed area so that they have some, some way of being in communication with the developer as the site plans are finalized. Okay. And I'm aware that NINA really has, is ambivalent about this. It's, they didn't reach a consensus for or against, so there's both sides of the fence on this, right? Nina has no position okay. formally on this. I think there are individual members on both sides of the issue. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. That's what I thought. Okay. Member Patterson. I'm just curious about the legal status 
of this would they have any what a neighborhood association uh, communication line which basically this allows for would there be any legal status at all in terms of I'm sorry, I didn't see the answer. No. The answer was no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Member Bain. But on the other hand, it would be a good way to keep mm -hmm. communication channels open between uh, the developer and the neighbors. And I've found in my discussions with the developers that they were open to this sort of thing and they've nodded their heads. I don't know what no, that I means. But if w wise developers would always be open <laughs> to, to this sort of thing. Further discussion? We have a motion and a second to amend Ordinance 12005 as read. All those in favor of the amendment? Aye. 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 Those opposed? The ordinance has been amended twice and has now been read for the first time. Are there other comments on the ordinance? Those in the council that wishes to speak? Um, so we're back to first reading. Members, of, did you say you said council? But did you mean audience? I meant audience. Okay, I'm sorry. Margaret. I was going to ask, but I didn't know that. That's what I thought I understood. And I was going to ask why no one asked that these these things could be worked could. out. Why must it be a part of the ordinance? Why is that necessary? Sorry, Debbie, if you could out, repeat the question out, because. Margaret, people cannot hear if we don't come to the microphone. So <coughs> the question was why these things were incorporated into the ordinance rather than being worked out in a more or informal process. And the reason that I brought these forward as amendments is that at first reading um, and when the discussion occurred about the level of agreement within council that's needed for the different conditions that have been set, um, there was significant concern that there may not be a way to enforce some of the conditions and to guarantee some um, that things really happen the way they've been described there if we don't have some kind of bond in place <clears throat> and that citizens felt like a lot of their concerns may not be incorporated in the, the final vote because the law director has indicated it requires a three-fourths majority to include some of those compromises that are that are listed in the um, the conditions so this is just a way to try to address those concerns and make sure that they're formally in the process other comments please come to the microphone yeah. <clears throat> Council rules provide that you state your name and your either address or affiliation. Hi, I'm Roslyn Semmelsberger. I'm the owner of both Hickory Creek Nursing Center and also Arcadia Nursing Center, which is in Coolville, but of course in Athens County. My late husband and I have operated these nursing facilities in Athens County for over 25 years. I also have <coughs> Um, six other facilities in Ohio and two in Pennsylvania. We've cared for the elderly in Athens and have provided employment to hundreds of Athens County residents. These two facilities provide care for 225 residents and this year we'll have a payroll of nearly seven million dollars making both homes one of the top five private employers in Athens County. I guess you're wondering why I'm here. <laughs> I'm here because I have a feeling that you haven't heard my proposals for a retirement community. I know that um, I've followed through newspaper articles with great interest the National Church's proposal for a continuing care retirement community. I know that's what they call it, but that's why, why I'm here. I'm not quite sure I understand how they can call that a continuing care retirement community when they have no nursing home beds. Um, 
somehow it's a very misleading title when you say it's a, a CCRC. And the, the national church community cannot bring with it to their retirement community any Medicare beds that are certified or any Medicaid beds that are certified. I know that it sounds a little confusing, but what it really means is that if there's a resident and they want to access their benefits to Medicare, they would have to leave the facility. <coughs> the assisted living really is what it is, the retirement community, and try and find a, a certified bed in another facility. The same is true if they wanted to access their Medicaid benefits. In other words, or thus, the National Church proposal that is before you only has the ability to bill privately. They don't have the right to bill Medicare or Medicaid, and you would not be able to access those benefits. I have been interested in rebuilding Arcadia Nursing Center for, I don't know, I want to say 10 years something like that. And I've investigated different real estate sites, but I don't think I have to tell you that finding a piece of property in Athens County that's flat and that has utilities, um, that's not on the side of a hill, or, you know, a lot of other different problems with soil, that that's a very difficult situation. I have not found anything until a couple of years ago, perhaps two years ago, something like that, I met someone from University of States. He's the developer and we sat down and we talked about the possibility of having some of my beds from Arcadia and some of my certified beds from Hickory Creek of Athens move to a site at University of States. Um, we discussed the possibility of adding assisted living beds, a facility, in addition to the nursing home beds, so that you would have a true continuing retirement community center that would have both certified beds and assisted living beds. Um, this has not been an easy process. Pulling all of that together has taken me quite some time. And in so doing, the state of Ohio has also changed many of the reimbursement uh, rules and, and laws right now. We're kind of in a state of, you know, a flux. So what I've done, I've had, I have a letter of understanding with University of States, and I am very close to finalizing plans with a full retirement center that would have everything that you could possibly think of. So that's one of the reasons I'm here. Um, I'd like to just kind of, if I have a couple more minutes, kind of explain to you maybe some of the benefits, you know, list them, the benefits that there could be <coughs> if I, um, if I might, between the National Church proposal and what it would be like if we had a retirement center at University of States. Since I don't want to, you know, sound too redundant here, but um, Medicare beds and Medicaid beds in Athens County, there is a finite number of them. They're not available to National Church Retirement Center. No matter what, no matter how it's done, one way or the other, they can never have beds unless they're my beds or someone else in Athens County has beds that will give to them or sell to them. It's a, it's a finite number. So in other words, if I have a Medicaid, let's say a resident 
goes into an assisted living. They continue to pay privately as a resident. They run out of money. If they were in a national church retirement center, they would then have to move from that community to another one that would accept, that was certified and could accept Medicaid billing. If the same is true if they have Medicare. In other words, if you have Medicare but you happen to be in an assisted living in the, in the proposal that you're looking at and you ran out of money, you would also need to leave that facility and come to another facility. What I'm trying to do is plan a, a full retirement center on university estates. I guess one of the other advantages is that that would be or that would have independent cottages also and have access to such things as golf activities and it would be much more like a retirement center that goes from um, where you could begin in, this, in independent living and move through the continuum of care into uh, long-term care or skilled nursing beds. Another consideration is that if I can develop the present plan that I have for 100 beds of skilled or intermediate beds and at least 75 beds of assisted living, I would expect there to be the same number of employees as Hickory Creek now maintains, which is over 200 um, with an anticipated annual payroll in excess of $5 million. With your present tax rate of 1.65, the payroll tax with, within your city would, would, would derive an extra $82,000 a year. This does not take into account the construction benefits that would also be there. Since this project, or my project, is not church-related and is, and is non-profit, <coughs> we pay property taxes to the county. What I'm basically saying is that we're moving beds from Arcadia, which is outside Athens, the city, into the city, and therefore that would be your extra revenue. If my project is allowed to go forward, we will be moving certified beds from Hickory and Arcadia, which would then allow me to create more <coughs> private rooms. Hopefully I'm expecting about 65 extra private rooms. With, in doing that, we would also be able to develop speci specialized dementia care and pain control units that <coughs> Dr. Carlson and Dr. Marks are very interested in developing with me. Having private rooms at the la last stages of life for the elderly of Athens County would be a great improvement to health care. Mrs. Simmelsberger, I've been asked by a council member if we could bring this. There are several other members of the audience that wishes to speak, so if you could wrap up, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, the only other issue I have is um, the one which would, in terms of conflict of interest, that my representative, who is on council, I would not expect my representative to vote on this issue. And since this concerns the Ohio University, I would not expect an employee or a student who works for the university or is at the university I would say that has that person has a conflict of interest and should not be allowed to vote either. Thank you. Thank you. Other members of the audience that wish to speak tonight? Yes, Mr. Cleo. Mm -hmm. Thank you, President Bias. I'll be very brief, just a couple of uh, responses to the issues that were brought up. Uh, the first is that it, it's never been a desire to have a large number of nursing beds in this project and the description about the availability of beds was a correct description with the exception of the fact that currently there's a, a process involved in Ohio called Certificate of Need. The legislature every two years talks about that whether to repeal it. It is still in place for the current biennium. 
and we anticipate at some point that would that would occur but we've never based this project on the uh, presence of nursing home beds in fact we have talked about never wanting any more than maybe about 15 to take care of the residents that uh, would reside in that location uh, I would mention as we talked in previous council meetings we are talking about a memory care unit in this uh, uh, project, which we, or, or Alzheimer's care, assisted living and independent. So it is a, a three levels of care. Um, we talked about the availability of private rooms and the other project. Uh, everything in this project is at least a one bedroom unit. They are no single studio type rooms. Uh, much more of an apartment, uh, independent living type complex. And the issue with Medicare benefits, we, um, we currently find in National Church that we have around 200 assisted living units uh, currently in place and traditionally two or three residents a year need to go to a nursing facility to take advantage of that maybe 35 days of, of rehabilitative stay that they would have their room rate paid for. We currently have um, 35 residents in those four facilities that are able to tap into a Part A and a Part B Medicare benefit through home health. So. It is true that we would not have any availability of Medicare coverage uh, inpatient uh, for those residents, but residents do regularly in our facilities and all across the country are, are tapping into home health care benefits for rehabilitative care in, the, in those properties. Again, I think it's important to remember what we've talked about this project being from day one. It's a market rate independent living facility with the availability of assisted living and memory care. It's never been designed to be uh, a location where uh, we would have Medicaid and nursing home beds. Um, we, we've talked about the possibility it would be desirable to be able to add some of those beds down the line if they would ever become available, mainly for the inpatient Medicare stay. We would not anticipate any residents in this building needing to tap into the Medicaid benefit while they were in our building because it's an independent, more of an active, um, retirement complex so thank you other members of the audience wishing to speak yes sir well, you're next my name is uh, Mark Lehman I live at 84 South May on the east side I um, have a couple things to say real quick uh, the first one is about uh, was touched on specifically whether uh, Dale Tamke should uh, be recused or, or able to vote on this issue. Um, you know, in a university environment, you have tenured faculty, and the idea of tenure is that they have some kind of protection to speak their mind, to, to act somewhat independently from the university. Then you have hourly employees who have a, have a uh, union to have some kind of protection to speak their mind, to be independent. And you have students who have historically <coughs> started social movements, uh, university and government, protesters, dissenters of historical worth, right? But a high-level administrator from a university has rarely, if ever, bucked a university policy, public policy that I know of. It's a conflict of their own interest. We've got a university administrator who's acting in local government on, as to whether or not the university administration should get concessions from local government. To me, that's a blatant conflict of interest. Uh, Thomas Jefferson rolling over in his grave type thing. And I think it's, I think it's a slam dunk. Shameful if that happens. Um, so, but that's, I just wanted to say that first. What I really wanted to say is as a citizen of the east side, um, you know, when, when this proposal first came up, my knee jerk reaction was, oh, what a nightmare thing, going to take away the green space and there will be more traffic and just construction in my backyard and, and no access to middle and low income people, which are, were things I didn't like. And I still have questions about all that. Um, but then I tried to step back um, because I've lived on the east side for 14 years in total. and. Uh, I have, have had a lot of seniors for neighbors, and I try to step back and think, now what, what's the, what's, wh why am I against this? Because I'm thinking, you know, I would love to have my family be around seniors, and I have enjoyed it in the past. So is it, is it just a not in my backyard thing for me that I don't want this to happen because I play there with my kids and walk my dog? 
is it, 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 should I rethink my position? So with soul searching and uh, mind rattling, um, I think the problem with this 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 thing, this development or this uh, proposal from day one, has been that it's been a, a top down. The university decided this would be in the interest of the university, and so let's get a, uh, some people together and put this thing together, and it's sprung on the community, this is what's going to happen. And, um, you know, it's the kind of divisive leadership that I saw from the university when I moved back here in 2002 and there was this big community university shrift, which there hadn't been before when I moved away from here in 1994, to my knowledge. And as I thought about it, it's kind of, um, well, what could, what could be different? Because, you know, most families on the east side don't see the elderly or uh, seniors as any kind of a threat. It's a, that'd be a good thing to be together. That's very compatible. Most people are worried about students, about saturating that thing with a lot of residences, multiple in houses with noise, right? So what, why can't we just send this thing back and start from the beginning with families, with students, with seniors, with the university, and try to build some community. To me, that's what local government is about. It's not about taking a piece of state land and making a top-down, kind of imposed, bullied even, uh, proposal that serves a very thin margin of the population. Let's do it together so we, everybody feels like they get a piece, everybody compromises, instead of what we have now, where you spring this proposal, and now we've got families against seniors. And to me, that is despicable. That's poor leadership, it's bad local government. Let's get this diverse community of students, OU, Appalachian poor, working together on these kind of projects from the very beginning, and I think we can do it. I think D Dr. McDavis in this, administration are much more concerned about community in general uh, kind of concerns and I think that uh, we can we could work on this thing much like instead of post hoc later on uh, to, to come up with a more fair equitable uh, piece of development that serves multiple stakeholders in the community what we feel like now is what we're going to get is if it goes through you've got the uh, I, you've got atomize isolated groups. Here's where the seniors are, here's the angry families, and here's the encroaching students, and it's, it's just more of a nightmare for Athens instead of trying to build community. So that's what I've been wanting to say since the beginning. Thanks, Alessia. Thank you. Other comments? Yes. My name is Sandy Bortle. I live at 124 Longview Heights, and I'm also a member of the CCRC committee. My first question is I just would like a clarification on, on Debbie's um, amendments. Does that mean now that's first reading, so now we need three readings on that, on those amendments, or? It's been read for the first time tonight. That's okay. how when something is amended, then that takes it back to first reading, and it has been read for the first time tonight there will need to be two further readings. Now that doesn't, uh, a council member could choose to do that at a special session, or if it is allowed to go through its regular every other week uh, council meeting, or the first and third of the month. I don't believe we have a fifth Monday in this month. Um, so there would be an opportunity for special meetings to expedite that possibly could happen by end of the year. If so council that members would choose if to they, If they would choose one. to do so. Yes. And then my other question concerning that, does that make a difference with, with the voting? Is it the regular majority or does it have a super majority regular attached majority. to that? Regular majority. Regular majority on that, okay. The, the only difference, Sandy, is if it's not uh, adopted by the end of the year because this was an election year, it will die at the end of the year. It'll have to be reintroduced in January. Okay, okay, then my Next question, if I may, or, or comment, um, would involve uh, the, the earlier presentation um, from Hickory Creek and Arcadia. Uh, as, as a CCRC member, we were approached by University Estates um, many, many months ago to take a look at 
considering putting the, the development up there. One of the concerns at that time with our committee was the cost of the land and the cost of the development. And many times during these council meetings, people have made mention that this CC, that the NCR project would be for the very wealthy and just for the, the few people who could afford to live there. We were afraid by going that route, in addition to being a much more remote site and that the seniors would be isolated, that it would indeed add cost to the projects. Well, with development, costs do get passed down to the people, to the end users. And we felt that it would become uh, a project that fewer and fewer people could afford to live in. And so that was one of the reasons we went back to the drawing board and stuck with the site that we had. The cost of land, the um, probably four previous attempts to bring this community, uh, type of community to Athens failed because of cost. So when we had land cost that were eliminated, that made uh, the project much more affordable for the developers and therefore for the people living in the projects. And I think if you could um, let Margaret address, I know that she would like to address uh, the comment about this being a top down in a university project. Margaret was the instigator <laughs> of this uh, committee, and I think it would really be helpful if you would just give her an opportunity to say how this came to be a project that involved Ohio University, not a project that was dictated by Ohio University. Thank Ms. you. Ms. Porter, we're more than willing to listen to anybody okay. that wishes to speak to us Thank tonight you. for okay. three minutes or so, and I'd be happy to listen to my neighbor and good friend. Margaret. I'm Margaret Topping. I live at 178 Longview Heights Road. Uh, before I start, I just want to ask one technical question of the law director. Does, do these amendments change the ordinance in such a way that it requires a different number of votes? It, Margaret, it would still require the four votes to pass the ordinance. Uh, these two amendments I would um, rule, and I'll issue a formal statement on that later, but uh, are not within the purview of what the Planning Commission considers, so they're going to require the supermajority to stay with the ordinance uh, uh, if it's adopted. So, they're, so they're, they're in that same category with those others that take five to stay with the ordinance on its adoption, but uh, it only takes four ordinances to adopt the four votes to adopt the four votes to adopt. Four votes to adopt. Thank you. Um, I did want to straighten out this thing of top down. Just let me give a little history again. <laughs> a lot of you've heard this so many times. We are probably the fifth or sixth effort of Athens citizens. I was on a committee in the 70s, which is a long time ago, uh, to do the same type of thing for our people so that we didn't lose so many of our senior population that really care about Athens and have been active in Athens. Um, at that, you know, each one had reasons for failing. When I retired, some of us got together and we thought, let's try once more. Maybe if, if it's just a community project and it doesn't get involved with tr another church or a university or anything, maybe we can do it because we're citizens and we care about this town. We started it out and believe me, it has been four years in March that I started. We started looking at land. I've got, I've got so many land drawings and people we contacted about their land and uh, blueprints and all these things and we contacted all the providers like National Church Residences. Some of them would not even come to Athens again. They had been so discouraged in the past with their experiences here. And we worked very, very hard. We had a great committee. We did put a couple people on from the university. Uh, and finally, Dr. Glidden and the trustees offered us a piece of land. It wasn't until January two years ago that that piece was offered to us and that we actually re reached some kind of arrangement on that. And we were absolutely elated because, just as Sandy said, it would broaden the diversity that we would be able to put into this community so it would be more like Athens. One reason we all love Athens so is it isn't like a suburb or a country town just 
some where it's got all these different populations and interests and people. Uh, we are so fortunate. So anyway, it allows a broader population. The student senate, and you talk about get the youngsters to support us. The student senate actually has passed things in support of us. Uh, the student population is for us. Uh, we have a list of 660 people on our mailing list who all want, are supportive. I've only had one person ever withdraw from that list, and they're moving away. Uh, it, it's just a very, very community-based support group, and we feel that it's a very needed thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I didn't mention, we've even got high school support, and we've got one of our high school people here tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, who's worked very hard doing computer work for us. Um, so we, we've got just a lot of broad support. It is not a university-based thing, but I will say that we couldn't offer it to as diverse a population if we didn't have a piece of university land, and we are extremely grateful for it. I think the reason we got it was for several reasons. I think the university is concerned about their emeriti, that so many of them leave here. It's also been proven, if you look at this, if you know this business, University of Virginia is one, uh, Purdue is one, I'm trying to think. They're all finding that it's a huge resource for the university because, uh, or their university, because what happens is when a person leaves a community, their allegiance goes to other things. And like if I move to Columbus or Cleveland, I get interested in the things there, and I don't give back to my university here or actually any of the other things that go on here that we all contribute to. And I think the university was, saw that it's working in other places to keep that loyalty and that allegiance among some of their senior uh, emeriti and loyal alumni and interested citizens. So, I mean, we're very grateful to have the advantages of the university here. So I just want to get across that it is very definitely a community effort, and it's backed by community people of all ages. And I'm sorry that there are those that are so concerned about that piece of land. Uh, they weren't concerned when the apartments were built. They weren't concerned when all the you know, other stuff went up on this floodplain. And for some reason, we seem to be a threat. I, I promise you we'll be good neighbors. We would love having children there from the east side. I mean, there's Easter, there's Christmas, there's all sorts of fun things we can do. Halloween, uh, I mean, it can be wonderful. So please, please try to look at it that way. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Other comments? Yes, sir. We'll come back to you next. Hi, my name is John Goody Kantz. Uh, I'm at 104 Maplewood. Uh, I own a business, and my house is both in that floodplain. I'm still actually back to square one when we, the planning commission was was uh, uh, going through the motions and I followed this uh, for a long time and I've gotten embroiled in it and everything like that but I still can go on the FEMA website at, at floodsmart.com and the propensity for flooding my house and my business is high. That's the reason I pay flood insurance. I'm still there. I, I think everyone else has kind of moved off to these other things, but uh, um, the, it, during those planning commission meetings, uh, Dr. Phil, Philip Cantino, I guess, asked the mayor um, if we were, they would in fact take Medicaid or Medicare patients also. This is a big stickling. Mr. Sands, I called you and you said that they would also. Now we're finding out that they, they're not, or they may be able to jump through them, some hoops and maybe stay there a couple more weeks. And uh, I mean, those kind of people, that's my mom and my dad. When they go to the hospital, they rely on Medicaid. Uh, they won't be able to go in this facility, okay? So um, that's, that's where I am. We, we love to have people. I have, I have seniors on my, in my, on my street, and I love them. And it, it's wonderful. I would love, Mr. Lehman put it perfectly. Uh, since the last meeting, um, four meetings ago, uh, here in the council chambers, um, I. I brought up the fact that no one's ever contacted us. Since then, they still haven't contacted us. There's, what, 200 houses, some odd houses in this neighborhood? They could have dropped something in our mailbox and said, hey, let's have a meeting, let's talk, and pretty much placated me about anything they wanted to do. But I do 
think like Mr. Lehman, that it's, it's been almost pushed upon <coughs> us. And I hate, I hate coming up here because I have a business. I, I try to bring things into the, as much in the community as possible, but I need the business from the community itself. And I don't want to make anyone mad. Uh, but this is, is, is kind of, it's gotten to be a real gnarly situation. Now it's not called the CCRC and we have uh, a, another facility here which is, is even better. So um, those, are, those all concern me. I won't talk too long. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bruce Steiner, and I live at 14 North May Avenue, and I was interested in Mr. Lehman's address <coughs> because my first Athens address 40-odd years ago was at 84 South May Avenue, uh, where I uh, lived in six years until my uh, marriage. <coughs> um, I'd like to speak first to the matter of conflict of interest. Uh, I read in the Athens News today a <coughs> finely calibrated, I really thought too finely calibrated discussion of which university employees might properly vote and of course which were beyond uh, the pale with some discussion of uh, tenure and how uh, tenured folks are naturally independent. Well. Uh, I was one of the founders of the Ohio University Faculty Senate and I followed its progress over the years and I've been at uh, many a Faculty Senate meeting where tenured full professors become globs of jelly in the face of remarks by a president or provost standing uh, there. I don't think it's a question of tenure or non-tenure. The fact is that this is a company town. It is a one industry town. And if we're going to begin eliminating from positions of local government people with any kind of university tie or who might conceivably be influenced by Cutler Hall, uh, we would have to uh, eliminate a huge proportion of our interested, public-spirited citizens. So I'm not much impressed by the conflict of interest uh, argument. Uh, secondly, although we've heard again tonight uh, the uh, willingness uh, to bring various groups together and uh, to uh, have uh, seniors among younger people I very much doubt that any such proposed plan would include a facility for seniors on this uh, particular site. Uh, I'm one of many seniors who enjoys living in Athens because there are uh, a lot of young people in Athens. Uh, there's a vibrancy about the place. And yet, I really do have questions whether Athens, and perhaps even Athens government, uh, is hospitable to all uh, age uh, levels. Uh, I've always, since I've been here, uh, as a bachelor until now, and as a widower now, voted for every school levy that came along because I think that we have wonderful groups of young people and they should be properly educated. I've been supportive of the Athens Rec Center, uh, even though that is obviously a facility for the relatively young and uh, the physically fit. And I'm not exactly in that last uh, category uh, anymore. Uh, I realize that wringing its hands as it does and making a bow in the direction of the largest single segment of our population, that the city government annually spends, what was it, $63,000 this year to clean up after the Halloween mess because you know, our younger population uh, has to have its particular 
fun. Okay. What I'm asking, and really all that I'm asking, uh, when we see uh, city expenditure on the rec center for the physically fit, a city expenditure on <coughs> cleanup for the students, uh, is some solid concrete recognition, such as this project, uh, that shows that Athens is a community that embraces people of all ages, actually does so, instead of, and sometimes it's not very subtle, the suggestion that, well, the good land, the flat land, the center part of the city, uh, the part that is near most of the facilities that many of us still use and would like to continue to use, like the Athens Public Library. This is for the young, and this is for the fit, and the elderly, those uncomfortable symbols of our mortality, can be put off in the hills if they must be put somewhere. I hope that the City Council will approve the ordinance that we've been discussing this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Yes, sir. Gene Amaral, 187 North Congress Street. <sighs> Too many issues. Um, I would first of all like to say that I really appreciated the um, comments before of, of the fellow who, I don't remember the person's name, who said that felt like this was coming from the top down. Um, I share that. <clears throat> yes, a group of people have been trying to create a retirement community for a long time in Athens. This particular situation, I do believe, is a top down job. And I feel, I feel that way, and, it's, uh, and I don't think it's because subjective, I think there's a reality to it. I work for the university also. So maybe I shouldn't be speaking. Uh, <laughs> um, but I uh, feel like the, um, the university is very heavy-handed many, many times and makes decisions and makes decisions, rational decisions. In Athens News today, it was said that the university didn't stand to gain much financially from this, this um, operation. I thank Margaret Topping for clearing that up. They stand to gain quite a bit from this. They're looking for contributions from those people who stay in town. There's no question about that. that that's one of the reasons they're, they would not give away a piece of land without expecting something in return. That's, that's ludicrous to believe. So I think that's, that's clear. The university wants a way to, to use that land to gain revenue, and that's one way they can do it. I'm going to go back now because when I first came 10 years ago to Athens to teach, I drove down through the Hocking Hills and I thought, what a beautiful, beautiful landscape I'm entering into. I came to the Hocking River going through Athens after it had been re-engineered by the Army Corps and I was appalled. I saw this drainage ditch running through the town, cutting across the campus. I'm still appalled by it. The fact that we think, as human beings, that we can control nature, that someday some flood's not going to come along and take out the hospital, psychiatric hospital, all the university facilities on that piece of land, is fantasy. Someday that's going to happen. And when it happens, the roads are going to be cut off, there'll be no place for people to evacuate to, and I think Yes, we're saying one more facility. One, this, is, this, is, this is a symbol right here. We stop here. We say no more. No more development on that floodplain. Because when it happens, it's going to happen. And it's going to be hell around here. It happens everywhere. We see it, we've seen it across this country, across the world. But people continue to believe somehow that we can control nature. We can't. We live on a river. That river is going to overflow its banks. It's going to flood the first floor of all those facilities. It's going to shut down the hospital, psychiatric hospital, etc. There'll be no place to evacuate to. Yes, you can put an evacuation plan to get out of the retirement community. Where do you go from there? 
We don't. The plans that have been, the, the, the information we've been getting on flooding is incomplete because it can't be complete, because we can't know, but we can predict pretty clearly from looking around us, from anywhere from the recent hurricanes in the Gulf Coast to the Mississippi River to Athens County when we've had floods. We can't predict exactly when or where, but sooner or later it's going to get, and we're going we're gonna to flood it. In the meantime, minor floods are going to spread water into new areas. Can't help but every time we add another thing, well, we'll add one more, it'll only be another inch, another one, another inch. That's what we're doing. We're nickel and diming ourselves into flooding out people's neighborhoods. We've got to draw the line. I am sympathetic to the elderly. I'm getting there myself. In a few years, I'll be looking for a place to live, probably. I just, not too long ago, I went through with my parents separately. One more issue I would like to draw attention to, once again, it came up several times tonight, to make it very clear, when you, if you've, I don't know if you've been through this with your parents, but I have, if you leave a retirement assisted living situation or a private situation, your own home, an apartment, assisted living, wherever you end up, the last place you live independently, if you're out of money, you try to get into a nursing home that's worth a damn. They're not going to take you because you don't have money up front, because they can't afford to. They use that money that you bring. Often you have to make a, you have to show money up front a year or two years in advance before you can get into it. Then after you're in there for a year, two years, yes, you'd go on Medicaid. Then they can afford to keep you on Medicaid, if it's a good one. If it's a lousy one, they'll take anybody they can get. And you'll get the nursing care that you get, end up with. So people li leaving this, this kind of a facility, if you're in a long-term facility where you can go from independent to nursing care, you're in. And the kind that's being planned for University of the States, I applaud. I think it's a wonderful idea. I'd like to see it, that kind of a thing, a number of places in town if we could do it. And we can, actually. There is an alternative to what people have been talking about, a community-based alternative. And it's going on right now. People in this community are working with the elderly to try to stay in their homes, to try to create environments in their homes that are safe. People don't go into nursing homes because they're sick. It's because they can't get up the stairs. My mother finally went in because she couldn't get up the stairs any longer. She had to go to some place where she could and get some help on a regular, you know, get bathed once, once a day or something like that. You don't need to build a facility, an isolated facility, with put hurt all the old people into one place to serve the elderly. There are so many alternatives to that. Now, I'm not saying that people don't deserve to have that if they want it, but for all the reasons I've given, I really, really stand firmly opposed to this particular facility. And, I was also feeling like up to this point that this council should be the one that votes on it because it's the one that has the information. But I'm seeing all these issues keep coming in and coming in that create more and more questions. And I'm feeling like better hold off on it and wait till the next council. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other comments? Yes. Hi, I'm Paige Alost, and I live at 24 Cable Lane. And I've had the great pleasure to work with Margaret Topping and several of the other people on the committee over the course of the last three years as they've undertaken this whole um, journey on trying to determine what the best options were for us. And I can't tell you what um, a great experience it's been getting to know them and have that time with them. Um, I speak to you from two different points of view, one as a resident of Athens and another as a former um, employee at a continuing care retirement community, actually at several different communities across the country. And um, I think at this point I go back to education and um, we really need to have all the facts about what this kind of community not only brings to its residents but what it brings to Athens and in particular the east side neighborhood. Um, Forty years ago, one of the first continuing care retirement communities in the country went up. It was a nine-story concrete building on about five acres in the middle of a little town that's almost identical to Athens. It's Dunedin, Florida. And um, Dunedin, Florida, 40 years later, 
looks at Meese Manor, at their retirement community, as um, one of the great things about their community. It's surrounded by a 100-year-old neighborhood that probably has some of the most sought-after properties in that particular part of Florida. In fact, in the three years that I lived there, we tried numerous times to move into that area. It was very well sought after because of the integration of the local community into Meese Manor, into the retirement community. Um, my son had his preschool graduation there and, and living so far away from family members I can't tell you what it meant to me to have a hundred grandmas and grandpas as he called them standing there cheering him on when he graduated from preschool and I, I come to you with selfish intentions uh, I have an 18 month old and I'm assuming she's going to have a preschool graduation at some point I still live far away from family and I'm looking forward to the grandmas and the grandpas being there I think there's also some clarification that needs to be had um, with regard to the difference between Medicare and Medicaid and how it factors into the, um, into the retirement process and independent living and assisted living. The goal of a community like this is to allow people to give up all of the, the heartaches and responsibilities that come with home ownership, allow them to be around people who are um, similar in age, similar in interest, they have shared things, things that are in common, but they also have a willingness to contribute to the community. And of course, the number one goal is to allow them to um, be as independent as possible for as long as possible. This is where assisted living comes in. And assisted living, compared to nursing service, is a relatively new concept. Of course, we know, you know, by our standards, it's 10 or 15 years old. However, the goal of assisted living is to allow a resident to remain as independent as possible with many of those services coming into their private residence or their private apartment or cottage or whatever they live in. Medicare and Medicaid do not cover assisted living. They have never covered assisted living. They cover the home health services that can be associated with that. If a resident has a stay in a hospital and they return to their assisted living home, they can receive home health care services just as they would in their private home. That's how that works. Most importantly, what you need to understand is the not-for-profit nature of this community. This was one of the things I was so pleased at when I first met this community, this, this committee that is putting this together, was their commitment to the not-for-profit concept. This is the concept that so many great things in Athens are built upon. It's that spirit of we're going to do this without the intention of someone making a bottom dollar on this. And it's the big difference between this development and the University of States development. And that's that bottom line commitment to the resident. I encourage you, do some homework. Get online and look at these communities. I promise you, this opportunity, if you put it out there to lots of other towns similar to this one, they would not have a hesitation to take um, a project like this. It means a lot to the community. It's going to mean a lot to the east side neighborhood. I'm looking forward to my son spending time at a community like this, and riding his bike around, and handing out mints at dinner time. I'm looking forward to him being a high school student and working in the dining room and getting to know the grandmas and grandpas. And of course, my 18-month-old, provided she is well behaved for the next four years, her preschool graduation. Please do your homework. Please look at these similar communities and similar towns that have done these things with great success. And I encourage the East Side residents to embrace this project and know what it can mean to their families and to their children. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Patrick Higgins. I'm with National Church Residences. And while I do agree and appreciate with the, um, the remark that was made about being unable to predict nature to the safe to the extent that things can be safeguarded I would draw your attention to the flood modeling that we recently uh, prepared and, and and submitted in support of this project um, it, I'd also like to address the fact that this project would not cater to would only cater to the rich. National Church Residences is, is the nation's largest not-for-profit developer of affordable senior housing. We have over 260 facilities in 27 states and Puerto Rico. The majority of those are for lower income um, seniors. While this is not, NCR does have several benevolent foundations and one of NCR's main tenants is that a resident has never been asked nor will a resident ever be asked to leave a facility for lack of ability to pay. Um, and I'd like to leave you with, um, as, as far as getting out, being able to evacuate residents in the, in the event of a disaster. I would just like to, again, draw your attention to the fact that we are required, all our facilities across the country have an emergency evacuation plan, and we are required to run those local and disaster, those evacuation plans past local preparedness agencies, whatever they may be in the area. 
Um, thank you very much. Other comments? Yes. My name is Margaret Manugian, and I come with a few biases, so I just have to address those real quickly. One, I'm, I live at 14 Sunnyside, so I'm a East, um, Near East resident. I um, am a gerontologist, so I teach families in aging classes. My students next term will put in over 1,200 hours of service to seniors in this community in a course of 10 weeks. Um, I also was trained as an undergraduate in environmental studies and can, I don't know if I still could, but was able to prepare environmental impact statements. So I come with a couple of diverse interests and concerns. I also have two children in the community. And um, I said this before, this project breaks my heart because the previous speaker, Mr. Steiner, is very accurate in talking about um, overall the biases and the ways that seniors, the elderly, are treated um, in communities. I'm not convinced, though, that this project is anti-senior. And the reason I feel that way predominantly is that there have just been too many issues raised on this project that concern me representing seniors, representing the neighborhood, representing the environment, representing the university, and representing development issues. If this senior facility were established as an assisted living facility, I would certainly embrace it. But I am, in terms of my students participating there, I would visit it, my children would visit it. We, my children volunteer with seniors. However, I feel that Athens, and I've been a resident for about five years, so I'm still fairly new, is a gem. I really do. And I think we have a commitment <coughs> to look at these issues from a comprehensive level at, from every angle. I think that we owe it to this community to represent the needs of not just one group, but all groups, and to represent the needs of not just the people, but the environment, and to represent the needs of people who are pro-development and those that are anti-development. I really would like this group to think about that comprehensive plan and to think about how we can intentionally create a community that embraces seniors and embraces the youth, embraces the students, embraces the middle-aged single parents in the community um, in a way that is a win-win situation. What I'm concerned about now is that any way you look at it, <clears throat> we've got people who are going to be on the outs, and I don't think that has to be the solution. But I would really caution everybody. I feel like there's lots of information out there that's erroneous. And I would really love to see something in writing that was comprehensive, that re re represented all the issues here with accurate answers. That's all I need to say. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Hello, I'm Lorraine McCosker. I live at 59 Elmwood, and I've talked a few times, so I'll keep it limited tonight. But I think that there are very compelling issues here, and I think what tonight has done is bring dialogue, and, and it's very positive. Um, I, I speak as a public health professional for 15 years and also as a very strong environmentalist, and I'm concerned uh, predominantly at this point and juncture about the environment in that floodplain <coughs> and the fact that we've just had a catastrophic flood and there are still almost 8,000 people missing in New Orleans from that flood. And this is, this is reality. This is very strong. I walked out to that area today with my dog, which I always do, and there um, it was pretty mucky. It reminds me of the tundra and the Arctic refuge. And I looked up and across the way, um, the area that uh, DOT was working on all summer is slipping. The trees are falling after them spending several hundred thousand dollars. Now that, that's a sign that we are not controlling our environment, that, we, that, that, that that's the soil that we have in Athens County and we need to work with it. Um, I also think that the point that there's going to be revenue generated from the <coughs> University of States is an incredibly important one. 
we just had a dialogue <coughs> about Stroud's Run and funding for that. And here we have an opportunity to provide the services that are requested in a safe environment and also generate funding. And I'd really like you to consider that. Um, I have some documents. I went to a <coughs> conference this year um, with the Trust for Public Lands. And there's been lots of literature uh, researched about the importance of green space and public lands for communities. Um, and just in summary also, in 2004, there were 220 measures on various ballots to secure land and funding across the United States. 75% of these passed. You know, this is, this is vision. It's looking to the future. And yes, we have social and cultural needs in our community, but we also have environmental ones. And once that's taken away, once that's affected, we don't have th those opportunities. So it's essential, like Ms. Manugin said, we look at the comprehensive plan, we plan for our future. We don't put a gas station in a neighborhood and then have a, f a, a leaking fuel tank. We look for the future, and I think that's very important at this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Yes. Elaine Getz and I live at 106 Maplewood Drive in the Near East Side and um, I'd like to discuss flood issues again. Um, I know that hopefully by now everybody on council is aware of some of these things. Um, I'm not so sure that all the seniors are aware. Um, I know that Patrick Higgins just stated that they had completed a flood model that showed that they you know, only someone impacted the neighborhood. Um, I am concerned about, in general, our floodplain management. Um, in this country, it has sh been shown uh, more and more over time that our current regulations do not, are not sufficient to prevent um, increasing flood damages and um, and all kinds of problems from flooding. In this case, um, the Army Corps of Engineers has just completed a new flood model that has not been approved by our city. That is the flood model which was used by NCR. Um, in that flood model, they used a Peak River discharge, which is very different, much lower over 10% lower, I believe, than the um, peak discharge used in the previous floodplain modeling. And um, with this lower peak di discharge, 10% lower, the Army Corps is coming up with a floodplain, 100-year floodplain boundary, which is essentially equivalent to the floodplain boundary, 100-year floodplain boundary, with a higher peak discharge. This should indicate to you all that with lower flows in our river, we are flooding more in our community. And I am not going to state <laughs> what causes this. I mean, there could be other reasons, but, but I, I believe that we are not doing a good job of managing our floodplain. To me, the issues around this proposed development have absolutely nothing to do with seniors, have nothing to do with development per se, but they have to do with floodplains. It is not smart to develop on your floodplain. Eventually it will come back and kick you. And we are not doing a good job of developing our floodplain. And I think that just mounting evidence has convinced people over time that now is the time that we need to stop. It's not anything about the, it being seniors, that seniors are a threat to us. It's that floodplains development is a threat to us. And I'm sorry for all the people that have spent so much time trying to come up with a good um, senior center for Athens, because it is needed. 
but I think you should applaud yourself with the fact that this has pushed something forward and that there is going to be an alternative that is not on the floodplain. It is not going to be as dangerous to seniors. If we could just get to work together to develop something, I think at University of States is the way to go, but, um, but something different than developing on our floodplain that is going to increase flooding in our neighborhood. And yes, we can use, use data that is different, a different definition of a 100-year floodplain and try to show that this doesn't affect anything, but yeah, you can show anything with data. But I think we really need to use the previous data, the previous peak discharges, to um, to use to cal do, show our um, to do our floodplain modeling to show that um, what the changes really are in our hundred-year floodplain, instead of this this uh, different peak discharge. That's all Thank I have you. to say. Thank you. I have more information if anybody needs it, but I think you all know. Thanks. Folks, uh, this is our first ordinance of the evening, and we have had over an hour's worth of public discussion. I would ask that you do not repeat the same points. Please come forward. Uh, we will. Uh, but also, if you could... Uh, I'm going to need to start imposing the three-minute limit soon. Um, my name is Chris Fall, and I live at 35 Morris Avenue. I think that this whole night has shown how many questions and how much controversy still remains about this project. There's questions about the floodplain model, whether it's sufficient or not. There's questions about the ordinance. The fact that it has to be amended shows that there's still questions about it. There's still questions about this playground and, and other issues that have been said that they were working with the neighborhood. There's questions about conflict of interest. These questions show that there is too much unknown about this project to go forward at this point. It's controversial. If, if uh, council goes ahead, ignores the conflict of interest question, Council will be seen as making a rash decision, and that is not good precedence. The conflict of, of interest question has to be addressed. It has to be addressed in a open forum. It has to be addressed with transparency. And I think, in reality, it has to be addressed by the Ethics Commission, because I know after reading the articles and actually those prompted me to talk to the Ethics Commission, that they have gotten several phone calls because there is so much concern about conflict of interest in this process. Process matters. This is not the only large-scale development that's being proposed for areas of town. Process matters because precedence matters. And I would urge Council to, to think about this, and I would suggest that until the lease is signed and negotiated and signed, that the conflict of interest questions are answered adequately and fully and publicly, that council cannot go ahead with any more readings of this ordinance. It does not fulfill council's obligations to be responsible um, servants of the public. And I would suggest that tabling this, amend this um, ordinance at this point is the responsible thing to do and if it has to go into next year, that's good government. We just need to go and answer the questions fully, transparently, and fairly. Thank you. Are there other comments before council? Uh, seeing that we will be moving on to ordinances for first reading, and most of those ordinances uh, concern next year's budget. I don't know that many of the people that came to speak before us tonight would find that equally as interesting as they seem to have found our first ordinance. So with that in mind, I'd like to declare a three-minute recess to allow anyone that wishes to leave to leave. We'll be back soon.
Yeah. You have to get them. Welcome back. Come back. If we could all come together. <laughs> We're now up to ordinances for first reading, <laughs> which will be a first, but anyway, let's give it a whirl. Ordinance 12105, an ordinance amending ordinance 07504, authorizing uh, reconstruction of Pomeroy Road, project number 208, member Weil. Okay, this is a... Um Amendment to 07504, where we're increasing it by about 25,000, if my memory is correct. This is because we have more things that have to be done on Pomeroy Road. Uh, most of the money is coming from ODOT, uh, Department of Transportation, to give us the road eventually once they repair it and put it in good shape. As far as I understand, this is to add a little bit more because there are more things to be done. A COVID, I believe, in particular. This was explained in the committee meeting of last week. Or was it Wednesday? I'm losing track. I believe it was Wednesday. Okay. We'll be meeting every night before. <laughs> <laughs> Are there further comments? Ordinance 12205, an ordinance to create a new uh, to create new city funds. Plural, Member Phillips. Mr. President, um, I move that we suspend the rules on 012205. Second. The reason for the suspension is that one of the funds is something that we need to move money into tonight and be able to start using because it's a grant that has already been received. So for the safety and well-being of the citizens, we need to get this done quickly. Is there a further discussion on suspension of the rules only? All those in favor of suspending the rules on Ordinance 12205? Aye. 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 Those opposed? The rules have been suspended. Mr. President, I move adoption of 12205. Second. This ordinance creates two new city funds um, for the courts. One is for the um, DUI grant, and one is for the SAMI grant. The SAMI grant is substance abuse and mental illness, and that is pass-through money that will go to the uh, to Tri-County Mental Health and Counseling Services to provide services. And the DUI grant seems pretty self-explanatory. Um, but this just creates funds that the money can go into and be used for those purposes. Further discussions? Member Weil. This is brought up in committee by uh, Judge Grimm. Yes. yes. I believe council members are in receipt of some correspondence from the judge regarding all this. Is there further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of Ordinance 12205? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ordinance has been adopted. Ordinance 12305, an ordinance amending the 2005 Appropriation Ordinance and the 2005 Interfund Transfer Ordinance and declaring an emergency. Member Phillips. Mr. President, I move that we suspend the rules on 12305. Second. The reason for the suspension, again, is because we've already received one of these grants and we need to be able to start using the funds. Is there further discussion on suspension of the rules only? All those in favor of suspension of the rules on Ordinance 12305? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? The rules have been suspended. Mr. President, I move adoption of 12305. Second. Okay, this ordinance um, amends the this year's appropriation ordinance and the interfund transfer ordinance and declares an emergency. Um, there are several sections here. In the first section, the $3,500 that's being appropriated to the general fund um, is for additional money that's owed for the public defender contract. The uh, $33,820 is being appropriated to the SAMI grant fund. That's for the um, substance abuse, mental, um, mental health. And um, $46,800 to the underage drinkers fund. And we're increasing the total appropriations by those amounts. In the second section, we're transferring between funds. We are moving $21,000, I'm sorry from the underage drinkers fund where we just put the money to the drug court fund and the DUI grant fund. So 21,800 to drug court fund and 25,000 to the DUI grant fund. In the third section, we are appropriating 21,800 to the drug court fund, 20,000 to the DUI fund and 5,000 to the DUI fund in the transaction class 200, 300 and increasing the appropriations. These, um, are explained in the letters from the judge and were, were discussed in committee. Um, these are related to these grants. Um, in the fourth section, we are <coughs> decreasing the drug court fund by 22,337 and change. The sewer fund, 
by 6,000 and increasing the drug court fund by 22,337 and change. And the sewer fund, we are moving things between transaction classes to balance those funds, both in the sewer fund and in the drug court fund. So that's just moving things from, from one transaction class to another. Further comments? All those in favor of adoption of Ordinance 12305? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ordinance has been adopted. Ordinance 12405, an ordinance amending Ordinance O-11904, reallocating revenues from the city income tax and declaring an emergency. Member Phillips. Mr. President, this ordinance um, is one that council does every year that determines where the mix of income tax um, revenue, how that gets divided up between different funds. This was discussed in committee, I believe, last Monday. Um, we will be changing this so that we'll be reducing it so that 74% will be going into the general fund, 19% to streets, 5% to recreation, and we'll remain at 2% to capital improvements. Um, last year, we made a change that reduced the amount going into streets and reduced the amount going into recreation. So this doesn't get us all the way back up to the amounts that were going into those funds, but the auditor tells us that we, we have more um, we're, we're doing better in our general revenue fund than we were at the end of the year last year. So we're able to make this change. Further comments? Member Weil? Uh, if I remember correctly, we had zeroed out the capital improvements last year, didn't we? Or did we? So we're adding it back 2%. Is that it? Yeah. No. No? We just went to the 2. But it wasn't, what was it last year? 2%. 2% as well. Okay. Member Bain. Oh, Mr. President, um, earlier in the day, I think the mayor was extremely impatient with me, saying that um, I was um, probably out of line with my comments. And I apologize if uh, he took it that way, but I was thinking back to 012405 and when we talked about his recommendations for the income tax mix. The thing that worries me a little bit is going with perhaps an indoor pool and perhaps a soccer field, and I brought those up the last time and closed, on top of a Stroud's Run initiative. Um, when last week we heard, and the reason why I think we have this ordinance with the change for 5% going to recreation, even with the community center already getting 6.6% up above and also 3.3% for expenses with the community center, is because they could not make it with the reduced amount, with the 4%. You know, that was with continuing operations without any new initiatives. And I guess that I am concerned about that because I listened to the recommendation, I asked questions, and I went along with it. And that was without Stroud's Run, without an indoor pool, and without that other thing that I can't remember soccer right now. Fields. Soccer, soccer fields. Soccer yes. Fields. And some of my best friends are soccer players. My kids did it. I mean, I'm, I'm a soccer mom, X one at that, but still. You know, so I guess I'm concerned because we changed the mix back and we're way over a million dollars, only a portion of which comes from fees. And we have the study. It's not scientific, but it certainly was an expression of assessment of management. And that management study said we needed some changes. And I guess I'm thinking, well, maybe, at least from my point of view, over the next year, we'll see some changes, perhaps. And, you know, sharpening up and so on and so forth to reduce this. Maybe we can reallocate it and, and pay for some of those things we want. But, you know, to say that just don't vote for it because, I mean, that isn't really fair because it seemed like we were redoing the mix to take care of the funds that we didn't have already. It wasn't for anything new. That's where my concern comes from. So now I'm hot around the edges. And I apologize for any um, disagree disagreeable feelings I found. But I do think I was acting in good faith in being concerned about this, because we heard about it last week. Further comments on Ordinance 12405? Member Patterson. I just would like to remind uh, Council, I, I know that Nancy knows this, but this uh, the recreation fund get, did go from 6% to 5% to 4% and now back to 5%. So I think that it's a process of finding the level of operation needed and I think that the 5% is acceptable. I mean, they, they work on um, creating public partic participation in, in projects such as the, the possibility of soccer fields. It isn't something that's going to be um, a huge 
outlay of cash and and certainly the possibility of an aquatic center is down the road considerably and and is not going to happen within this five percent in this year i hope so <laughs> other comments Ordinance 12505, an ordinance to make appropriations for current expenses and other expenditures of the City of Athens, Ohio, during the fiscal year ending December 31st, 2005. Uh, I think we have a typo that should read 2006. Actually, I think There's it says it on the ordinance. The ordinance does. The, uh, yeah. Okay. Anyway, we all understand that that means 2006. Right. Member Phillips. Sign print right here. Down. Um, this is our annual appropriation ordinance. This is basically the core of the city's budget. Um, I have a couple highlights that I want to make, and then I really want to hand it to the mayor to um, add anything else that he wants to. Um, the I think that. For the most part, this reflects things that we've discussed in a lot of detail in a, a series of committee meetings, um, including the 3% um, raise pool, um, updating our non-union pay scale. It reflects you know, any negotiated contracts that we have. There are a lot of things that are, that are pretty well set in um, the ongoing operations of the city. There's one new piece in here that I'm very excited about. Um, after the years of work that citizens have invested in working on the comprehensive plan for the city of Athens, um, which is working its way through the Planning Commission and soon to come to Council, um, we are including funds for a city planner in this budget so that we can get someone into that position who has the expertise to help us with implementation of the comprehensive plan so that someone can help review the city's codes and review um, ordinances in other cities to you know, help us do a good job of implementing all the work that people have put into the comprehensive plan. So I'm really, really pleased that that's in there. Um, there was some reference in this to the the changes in fees that we discussed particularly in the area of code enforcement and i guess i would just emphasize that those changes were based on a study that was done by maximus um, based on the actual cost of providing services and you know any permit fees that were either increased or decreased that was based on what it actually costs us to provide those services and when we talk about some of those fees being used for the planner some of those activities are things that the planner will do like reviewing site plans and proposals for subdivisions and planned unit developments so i just want to make it clear to the citizens that when we're when we're <coughs> talking about this we're talking about um, fees for work that the planner will be doing we're not talking about taking money from some other area and using it to fund this position I think that it's um, a, a well thought out rationale of uh, where the funds can come from for that position. Um, the other thing I would want to <coughs> alert council members to, you may remember that in the discussion with Judge Grimm about the, um, the grants and the programs that the court is working on, there was a request that we cover um, an additional portion of one of the probation officers, and that is reflected in this budget and I just want to make sure folks know that that's in there as well so the grant will cover a probation officer we will be covering a portion of that and the the existing position will remain so I think that we're talking about increasing someone there so that's that's just another increase from general revenue that I think folks need to be aware of and anything you want to say in summarizing this and drawing our attention to specific things would be very helpful sure one of the things that uh happens in here is if you look into the general fund area you'll see that the uh, old income tax department is budgeted zero uh, and what really on the auditor's recommendation and I know this really hasn't been I don't know how much discussed by the committee combined the auditor and the income tax office into one budget of the auditor's office this will allow for greater flexibility in the ordering of supplies spreading of the workload and, and a lot of other issues up there that there really aren't two separate offices or two separate functions maybe that that office does but budgetarily and cost to the city it's now reflected all as one there's no increased cost 
uh, to the city to do it that way, but it's just a practicality standpoint uh, upon the recommendation of the auditor. There are a number of funds in through here that I did not put any uh, appropriations under, like state highway dollars, wheel tax dollars, uh, state issue two, or where you know we have some uh, grants that we receive. <coughs> As those projects evolve, we will then attach the appropriations to those. Uh, the other thing I would be remiss not to not to mention to you is that uh, this budget is done based upon, uh, except for the exceptions that uh, Councilmember Phillips has mentioned, uh, no other really growth to the staffing levels of the city. And when we get to the staffing ordinance, I want to go through a few things on on that. But it is also done without a precise knowledge of the carry forward funds that we have. We know what we came into during the year. We know through October revenue and expenditures. We can project both of those. Uh, I feel that it's the carryover balances will be there to help do these. Uh, but what we'll really know about mid-January. And if we have to make adjustments to the appropriation ordinance, we'll be back to the new council then to, to do those. But. Uh, for the past uh, years that I can remember, we haven't had to go back and do that. Uh, I don't think we're going to have to this year, uh, but there are a couple of questions in there because the general fund, um, because of the batch of the grant, uh, the SAMI grant, which you've, you approved in the early ordinance, uh, and the uh, f impact of, I think, about $44,000 in there of changing the salary schedule for non-union personnel within the general fund, uh, it, it may, it's not going to be a big cushion that we're going to have this, this coming year, but it, I think we will have some. Other comments? Ordinance 12605, an ordinance authorizing staffing levels and non-union pay scale and slotting for the fiscal year ending December 31st, 2006 repealing all ordinances and consistent therewith and declaring an emergency. Again, Member Phillips. Um, I would really like to ask the, the mayor to speak to this. I guess I would note that I have a question already um, just from looking this over about the planner, which is in the, the staffing levels, but I still see a GIS position in the pay scale. So. Whatever general explanation you'd like to give us is great, but that's a question that I have. Well, the the, stat, the levels that get created within the classifications are generated by what's in the staffing ordinance that follows. Uh, the I'm not really recommending at this time that the GIS position be eliminated. Therefore, I kept it in the uh, pay scale. But if you turn to uh, Exhibit A, authorized staffing levels, and you get down to uh, the GIS coordinator system analyst under general other admin, it says one open, no budget, which means I didn't put any budget money in there. And there, I've tried to do that, like in my office, uh, there's one executive assistant's been open now. This is the second year in a row. Uh, it's still open. There's no budget for it. Uh, you can also see there's one custodian with no budget, but an authorized position because I have to, if you haven't changed the authorization, I have to keep it here, but I have to tell you I think that there's no budget. Uh, we already covered GIS. In the police department, I have a question here for you because uh, you had authorized last time 18 police officers in one patrol officer grant. We no longer have any grants that are supporting any police officers and have not had for two or three years. So I combined and made that 19 patrol officers and then I went out and said, we have four right now that are open. One is on a military leave, so the maximum you're going to pay them is 30 days. And, and, the, and there is only one of those 19 slots that does not have a budgeted item for them. Uh, but although I will point out that the military slot is only budgeted at the maximum we would pay upon request on a military leave, which I think is 30 days pay. Um, 
of those open, we are in the process of trying to fill those. Um, but I don't know if you, since you had indicated that separately as being a grant position, do you want police officer, patrol officer rather, to be at 18 or 19? And that's one you're, you're going to have to decide. You got, if you go through the budget and then look back at it, uh, for some reason you wanted to keep it noted as a grant position. And I believe that discussion was more was that because it wasn't really funded by the general fund. I still don't have it funded by the general fund by the indication of no budget. But you'll have to decide whether or not you want that in the authorized staffing level or not. And the second page of it, uh, again, there's two open in the fire department. Those two were created back in 1996 and 1997 when we had eight firefighters retiring. So we upped the level. We filled those. We kept it for a couple of years. The general fund started declining through attrition. Uh, we had those that were open. We have not hired a new firefighter in five years. Uh, so they're actually funded position is the same thing as it was 10 years ago and probably 20 years ago. Um, there is one open general secretary in the code office, no budget. Uh, the planner, of course, is new. Uh, there are two code inspectors positions open, but they are budgeted for. I have to budget for two director of street departments because under the laws of the military leave, you have to pay that person a maximum of uh, duty pay if they would request it. So you have to still have the slot there to put it back into. Uh, so I left one. Uh, there's two open positions in maintenance tech training because that's what's in the labor agreement. One of those I've funded, one of them I have not <laughs> been able to. The maintenance specialist where one of those people is working as the street department supervisors I did not put in a budget for it. Um, and I think that can, that's all of the areas that are in your staffing, but either open and funded or open, not open because they're not funded, put it that way. The only real decision point would be on the, on the police officer, patrol officer. Law Director Hunter. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'd like to indicate to council that um, I know you've made some, you're dealing with difficult times in, in staffing, and you've made some uh, decisions recently to address uh, turnover in the auditor's office by increasing salaries and so forth. Um, I just want to point out to you, I uh, haven't been consulted or participated uh, in the budget process um, to date, uh, but we do have an issue in the law director's office also. The, the budget there has been... Um, actually stagnant to decreasing for the last several years. The workload continues to increase. I indicate to you tonight that um, the uh, part-time prosecutor, uh, Gilberto Chavez, has resigned. That's been a revolving door position ever since council created as only a part-time position. And I really do think that council is going to have to address the issue at some point in time of making that a full-time position. Thank you. Other comments? Have we anything else at all? Ordinance 127.05, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into a contract to provide fiscal support for the operation of the Athens Area Chamber of Commerce. Member Phillips. Well, Mr. President, um, should I amend this first? I, I, I need to amend this. So I move Chamber to amend 127.05. <laughs> Um, the reason for the amendment is um, just to make sure that the agreement clearly references the scope of work. The ordinance does, but the actual signed agreement um, just has the scope of work on the back. So the proposed amendment is that where it says chamber agrees to use the sum paid by the city for the support of economic development, including but not, I would stop there and make it say but not limited to the activities detailed in the attached scope of work dated December 2005, and then I would add the date December 2005 to the top of the scope of work, which is on the back of the agreement. So just so the agreement itself references the scope of work. Further comments on the amendment proposed only? All those in favor of the amendment as read. 
Aye. Those opposed? The ordinance has been amended. Um, and we did, just to speak to it in general, we discussed this in committee. Um, Jennifer Simon was here and did have some input to this. Um, the general idea was that um, people wanted some more specifics in there about what the activities are that the chamber is engaging in using public money. So we did spell out a lot of the specific work that much of which the chamber already does for the for the city. Um, and we put in a few other things where um, the chamber has been working with citizen groups on the uh, clean initiative and some of those quality of life kind of campaigns that the chamber has been involved in. So we just added more specificity to the contract. 127 has been amended and read for the first time. Ordinance 12805, an ordinance authorizing the mayor to extend the current contract to provide financial support for the operation of the Athens County Convention and Visitors Bureau. Member Bain. Oh, I'm going to well, refer to and we are referring <laughs> to Member Phillips. Um, Mr. President, I'd like to amend 12805 as well. Um, when we discussed this, we really briefly had a conversation about also adding, adding some specificity to this. So um, I guess what I would, I'd like to amend it to include under Do the visitors. we have a second? Did second. I get a second? second. Okay. Um, visitors Bureau agrees um, that we would add language that mirrors the scope of work under work with community groups um, to promote community events. Um, and use numbers two, three, and four. They would become numbers one, two, and three. But some of the work that we included in the chamber's scope of work really is promoting some of the community events that happen in Athens. And the, the tourism board does get involved in this work already, but since we specified that in the chamber contract, I thought we should include it as well here. Further discussion on amendment only, Member Bain. Um, I believe that um, we haven't really discussed this with the con the Convention Bureau, and I think it, that we'll have to um, discuss it with them, but we'll go with the amendment, and then if, there, if we have to amend the amendment, we'll do it. Other comments? Member Patterson. I actually would prefer to defeat the amendment and amend it on second reading after uh, consulting with them. I just feel that would be a more appropriate procedure. Um, or we could just table it too. I mean, well, yeah, that would work as well. But I, I just feel that her input, she may want some additional things in there as well. And to just there is a motion before the chair to amend at this point, so we are discussing right. the amendment only. Uh, further I comments on the amendment only. All those in favor of the wait, amendment. Wait, wait, I'm President. sorry. Can Other I, comments, Jim? Can I withdraw my amendment? If your second will withdraw her second. And we can just bring it back after we've had that discussion. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'd can like I to do that. still ask my question? <laughs> <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Why not? Point out to me again the phrases you were referencing, please. Um, in the chamber scope of work. Yes. Uh, in the fifth section where it says work with community groups mm -hmm. about quality of life, I would have it just say to promote community events and have the things that are two, three, and four in the chamber contract because those really are kind of tourism events related things. Okay, thank you. Okay, to clear and it's part up of the larger accountability piece, I think, that we're trying to strive for in these contracts, so it's not just whatever they want to do with the money. So we're all in agreement that Ordinance 12805 has been read for the first time only as originally written, submitted to Council. Ordinance 12905, an ordinance amending Athens City Code, Title 29, Housing Regulations, Chapter 29.03, Rental Dwelling and Housing Permit. Member Bain. Um, Mr. President, this could have been introduced by all members of council. I think we participated in it. We also applaud those landlords that are already doing it. What we are asking is that um, the landlords would um, complete a current tenant occupant education form on all rental dwelling and rooming houses permitted for fewer than 10 occupants. Said form will be fil filed by the Department of Development, Enforcement and Facilities by September 30th of each year by the landlord. Changes in the tenant occupant subsequent to September 30 will be filed by the landlord with the development with the same department within 30 days of the change. Um, the concept is one that is not unique 
it's not even new. We copied it shamelessly from other places who've had success with it. And if you turn the page, this is what we had up till now, thanks to our clerk, Debbie Walker, who pulled the various ideas together on a couple of sheets. I personally would like to see it online. I would like to see it totally online. But fundamentally it is, we have occupancy restrictions on this dwelling unit. Um, if the landlord does not um, put up the placard, and I went over and checked, made sure mine are up, that says it's permitted occupancy is three, then there could be a discussion between the landlord and the tenant. I guess I'm always an idealist. <laughs> um, front yard parking, you're just not allowed to pull your car around to the grass, sorry. Um, trash can placement, out of view from the street. I drove down uh, Palmer Street today, <laughs> and we need to work on that one. Um, litter. Accumulation of refuse, noise control, nuisance party, and animal control. And so what we're saying is, um, since the landlord is often the, the primary person in the community that the students interact with when they become residents, this is a way for us to ask the landlord to act as a, a bit of an educator for us. I remember Stephanie Goldsberry, who, is, who first made me aware of how much of that, that form of education takes place in our community. Since then, I've learned a lot more, but she started me thinking about it. So I think that's the spirit of this. Um, I know there are some landlords who do a really wonderful job on this, and the rest of us who don't will now be starting. Further comments on Ordinance 129? If it passes. Paul. Uh, thanks for doing all the work, uh, everybody Thank involved. Debbie. Thank you, Debbie. <laughs> Other comments? Ordinance 130.05, an ordinance amending Athens City Code, Title 27, Land Development, Chapter 27.01, General Provisions. Member Bain. Mr. President, in the absence of Mr. Tamke, I would like to say that we um, discussed this last week and um, agree with this interpretation in the Land Development Chapter 27. Um, it would apply to future developments. I think that when we were doing the initial land development ordinance, and I have to admit I was reluctant, at least for a while, on it. But when we were doing it, I don't think anybody imagined the scalping that would be part of developments later on. And I think that um, by putting this in, we've said, we will say if it passes, that the shape, size, and natural topographic features of the terrain will be preserved. I think people have said in the many citizen inputs we've had that they really love the way the place looks and um, they like to keep it that way. And that's fundamentally what this does. It has no teeth, but it's um, basically a statement of, um, of our opinion. And the teeth can come later in this much vaulted planner position. <laughs> that was going to be my comment because actually you left out what I think is an important adjective there. It says general shape, size, and oh, natural topography. It's in there, but I didn't read it, huh? I didn't hear you read it. And, and that's the part that, did you, okay. But yeah, I just left it out. Okay. That's the part that leaves it open to interpretive movement. Right. Right. Okay. Other comments? Member Patterson. Just an informational point I said last week. I didn't know where I was reading about the, the trees. It's in the comprehensive plan. Oh, I just was doing a little uh, casual reading in our own uh, proposed um, comprehensive plan, and that's where it was. Yeah, replacing trees. Um, a, replacing and, and maintaining the tree canopy and increasing the tree canopy in Athens in general. Mm -hmm. That's right, they were big on that. Very good point. Thank you. <laughs> Other comments? Ordinance 131.05, an ordinance amending Athens City Code Title V Public Utilities, Chapter 5.03, Water Regulations. Member Bain. Mr. President, we have, um, we discussed this topic a bit last week, and um, through my own negligence, I would note that the sewer increase was not on the agenda tonight. I just made a note for Debbie to put it on the special session that we'll have next week. But having said that, um, one of the things that we do is we send people out to read meters. And um, we had an estimate earlier about what it costs. And um, we, our charge was relatively modest. And um, Ray and I had a meeting, and everything is kind of on hold with respect to the total changes in utility billing. But one thing we can do is increase that rate. 
and possibly, you know, by $15, not a huge amount of money. But there are some other fees that the delinquency turn on, the turn on penalty for after hours, delinquency letter. My opinion is it probably uh, costs more money than each of these is bringing in. And since the Maxima study has started us down one road, let's um, go back in the future and change the rest. But for now, the $35 transfer turn on charge is a modest amount and it will get us closer to recouping our costs. And that's what this is going to do. Other comments? The rest will come later. And <laughs> Member Sam. Just explain for us that the transfer slash turn on charge is yeah, the only thing for a, is this. basically a landlord transferring the account to a tenant back and forth. Yes, that is. Tenant, can you take that? Ordinance 13205, an ordinance granting a revocable license to Brad Jagerman, <laughs> owner, 15, 17, and 19 Bayard Street, to allow parking on the city right of way. Who will be speaking to this in Mr. Tamke's oh, absence? I can do that, Mr. President. This, um, this ordinance is um, for a revocable license that is already in effect for these addresses on Bayard Street. Mr. Jagerman has recently become a new owner and is applying to have that revocable license for parking on a an alley behind the property, um, ha having it renewed and transferred to his name. Timber Bain. And right just there. as a, an addendum to this, um, if we look at the place next to Laura Parati's property, I do believe we have a revocable license uh, for use of that alleyway too. So it's not developed, never has been, probably never will be, because we have revocable licenses on uh, both sides. So yeah, I remember doing it, I think, but maybe not. I think you're talking about the extension of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's totally, it would totally be landlocked without this. So. Anybody else wishing to speak to the ordinance? Resolution for one reading, R-1005, a resolution amending resolution R-0905 indicating the services the City of Athens will provide for the proposed annexation of University of States, Inc. and others, Armitage area, approximately 826.586 acres as requested by the annexation petitioners, introduced by Member Sands and Bain, who wishes to speak. Um, I can do that. Um, Mr. President, <laughs> last week, or, or um, last meeting, I believe, we passed a resolution that talked about the services we would provide to the University of States Development if they are annexed to the city, and that included water and sewer, police and fire, and street maintenance. Um, but um, after I believe the county commissioner's office looked at this resolution. They realized that there will be a small part of what is now Armitage Road, which extends beyond the boundaries of University Estates. Services, two houses, I believe, and our water wells. Um, and there was a discussion <coughs> among the mayor and council that it was in the city's interest to um, continue to maintain that portion of the road, particularly to, to uh, be able to service our water wells. So this simply amends the language for, from our prior resolution. Further comments? All those in favor of adoption of resolution 1005? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Aye. The resolution is passed by one. <coughs> Announcements and other business. Um, committee meeting? <laughs> yep. I'll take a kind of about it. Transportation yeah. committee. Yeah. Next time, next time. It's kind of a special session. Everything on, right? Everything? I don't know. Or is it the budget and the, the budget contracts? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The budgets only? Budget items? All the first reading things? All the first reading items. Plus the sewer. Okay. Okay. Increase. Okay. Second reading item tonight would not be on the special agenda. I don't know. That's but yes, it, it's a now first reading. That is now first reading. You're correct. Okay. okay. Everything's a first reading. 
Okay. So we have it at seven and transportation after. Is that what's going to happen? I have no problem with that. Okay. Is that okay, Sarah? Mm -hmm. Other committee meetings? How long will you allocate? First item on the agenda. Seven <laughs> hours and 15 minutes. I want to know when to show up. <laughs> Watch the TV. Mm. <laughs> other uh, announcements or other business? Opportunity for citizens to speak on items not covered on tonight's agenda or other legislative items. Seeing none, the last item on our agenda is an executive session to discuss labor negotiations and pending litigation. Um, do we have a motion to move into executive session? I move we go into executive session um, with the law director, the mayor, I guess Kathy's involved too. I was And city council, of course. Okay. Uh, Sands? Aye. Sarah? Aye. Debbie? Aye. 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 Okay. Uh, we will take a five minute recess while uh, we shut down the cameras and then move into executive session. The only item after we come out is adjournment. Thank you. Sure.